speaker today of the talk, which is so non-deterministic that the title has changed since the announced one, and it's called Layout Randomization and Non-Determinism. It's still the same theme of two forms of probability, non-deterministic and probabilistic, which are very much part of Prakash's interest. So it's a great honor and a even greater pleasure to speak here in Prakash Fest. It's an honor because I'm honored to be part of the people speaking at the occasion to honor Prakash. <laughs> That's a little bit sort of an analytic <laughs> 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 extent of some sort. <laughs> But it's more than that, it's a pleasure, it's a great pleasure to speak at the birthday of a dear friend. And so, my dear friend, happy birthday, many happy birthday. <coughs> Coming back, keep doing more. So anyway, so one thing Prakash said was that postdocs shouldn't just emit a, a, what they, a preprint. They should be out there and interact. So I thought it might be fun, well, for me, a, to look back at my interaction with Prakash in terms of what preprints never got emitted. <coughs> they more got omitted and emitted. So, but they're still important for me, so the process isn't just production of papers, it's the sort of, I don't know, <coughs> the intellectual process in which ideas come and go and eventually, hopefully, they amount to something. So one idea that Prakash alerted me to, it was in this paper in Concurro 2, was the idea of using showcase capacities. So this particular one, it doesn't matter, the, the important point about the showcase capacity is that it's super additive. So unlike a probability distribution, Instead of inequality, you've got inequality. So I thought, ooh, that's really super. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great way of combining probability and non-determinism. Because if you look at it, suppose we've got a collection of measures of UI, and we take their lower envelope, that's just the infimum of them all, then that's a super additive showing capacity. If you take the supremum, you'd get a sub-additive one. That would be really sub. What? And that would be really sub. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so, so this is like the most pessimistic one, that would be like the whole power domain, and the alpha one would be like the whole power domain. Uh, yeah, like the whole power This is the Smith one, I mean, the whole one. So that's fine, but sadly, this map is many to one from convex sets of measures to capacities, even when there's only three points. So since I only just understood perfectly well why that's the case, and, and the proof is very pretty, I thought I'd spend a second showing you the, the country's apple with three points because it uses biocentric coordinates. Uh, so suppose we've got three points, x, y, and z. We can plot them in three space in the usual way, and we get this little triangle at the intersection of the upper quadrant with the plane, and we're plotting it the Cartesian coordinates. <coughs> but instead, instead of thinking of the points as being at the vertices of the triangle, the, the, the coordinating points, we can actually think of them as being the sides of the triangle, and not biocentric. I think of this as an equilateral triangle with each side having length 1, okay? So what's the barycentric coordinates at this point? It's the distance to x, the distance to y, and the distance to z. Okay. Actually, they're homogeneous, you can multiply by anything. But by, but by taking this to be 1, the distance here is equal to the area of this triangle here. And if you normalize the area of the little triangle to be 1, then these areas are actually, the, this area is the probability of, being, of it being x, this is the area's probability of it being y, and this area is the probability of it being z. Okay? That's kind of cool. So then, let's switch to two uh, sets of probability distributions that, that both are in red. And you see, although they're very different, they're both the same distance from x, the same distance from y, and the same distance from z. Okay? So and there's many, many countries out like that. So the situation is really bad. At least, we can, at least it's pretty. Okay. So that never came to anything. <coughs> well, later on, <coughs> when I was there, Vincent also was a kind of common well, part of the group. And anyway, so Prakash and I started talking about quantum <coughs> computation. And we wanted to, like everyone else, but maybe we were, we were the first, I don't know if we were the first, but we never succeeded anyway, because you can't be the first if you didn't succeed. Uh, anyway, we tried. And so I always like this thing. The abstract is very uncertain. <laughs> 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 this is a placeholder. We had some difficulties anyway. But anyway, it's good for me. I learned some quantum stuff. I don't know if it's any good for Prakash as an experience. But anyway, yeah, it says so. Good. Anyway, later on we succeeded, most recently, 2013. But this time by a different strategy, which is, although I'm a co-author, I never worked with him. So the method which seems to work is you work with somebody else, in this case, Vincent, and then Prakash gets a really good student, Philippe, 
<laughs> and they all work together, and everyone, eventually everyone talks together except for me. <laughs> that work. Anyway, so this work, but still, this, this is, one way or another, this is good stuff. It's just the process of producing intellectual material isn't straightforward. And there's many complexities, I'm sure one could make a vast catalogue of such complexities. Nonetheless, a, what, a particular theme here is duality. And I'm interested in working with Prakash and Radu and duality, and maybe that will give a preprint, maybe it won't, but it'll be yet more fun, so I really look forward to that. Okay, so on to the subject of my talk, which, like these, <coughs> like most of these things that do with various kinds of probabilistic computation, or, well, leaving out quantum, I guess, non intelligence computation. Now, this is in the context of security. It's work done with uh, Martin and uh, Jeremy Plano, Martin and Badney, Jeremy Plano. And so, in security, there's many attacks and many defences, and defences aren't perfect, but they do some good. So in particular, I'm interested in attacks against the heap, such as the jump to libc attack, where you sort of guess where <coughs> some library program is sitting, which you shouldn't have access to, but you just guess and you go there, and bad things start happening. So a defence against that is not to put the library program in a fixed place in the heap, but just to randomise. So this is called the layout randomization. And apparently it wasn't a lot well understood, then Martin and I at least did a little bit of theory for it. So having done a certain amount of theory, a, oh yeah, sorry, this is, this is just saying what I just said in a bit more detail, I should have said that. So this layout randomization is, is apparently quite widely used. So the idea is just to repeat with a little diagram the layout, the latex didn't work well. Anyway, so here's, here's the memory, and maybe x is laid out over three words, y over two, and z over four. But instead of putting them in fixed places so that y is always at 4, so you could just jump to it, if you happen to know that fact, what you do is you just randomize it. You just you, you choose randomly from a collection of possible layouts around the one, and maybe the, this x gets moved over to there, and the y is way over there, and the z here. And so jumping to here will just get you to some un unallocated thing, and that's going to cause an error in this model. Okay, that's how the model the attack failing. So you want the attack to fail with high probability. What to so as I said, Martin and I did the first shot of this using material semantics and ideas. And other people, Radu, for example, Radu, sorry, did other things, other people. So here I wanted to think about an important thing is security in a concurrent context, like in the internet, for example, lots of people talking to each other. So concurrency generally entails some kind of non-determinism, ordinary non-determinism. And this is this randomization is probabilistic on determinism. So how should these two interact in that context? Mm -hmm. And it's really a puzzle, and I'm still puzzled, but what I'd like to convey to you in the talk is what what, what the puzzle is. It's, it's really unclear. And it certainly isn't what I thought it was to begin with. Okay, we used denotational methods rather than operational methods. That was just kind of for fun, in a way, really. Or just to try something different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And importantly, we can't, use, not, we can't use distributions to deal with probability because our events aren't independent, so we have to use random variables. So that's interesting because in semantics, people have been interested in random variables and non-determinism. So this is like an application. So if you're going to do it, if you've got a theory of it, it should apply to this case. <coughs> okay. Um, this is probably not to say anything you don't know. It's just remarking that probability is used in many contexts in practice, and non-determinism arises in many contexts in practice. Okay. And here I'm thinking of something like, say, non network communications or something, and probabilistic cryptography schemes, like, I guess that's the couple I want to think of. But I mean, yesterday we had another example a, of differential privacy, but there was, there was quite a, a few of such things. A, anyway, here's a little game which looks very innocent, but uh, has all the issues in it. So player one chooses a bit by flipping a coin. Player two just tries to guess it, okay. and what's going on? This isn't innocent, because player one could be some cryptographic scheme that depends on choosing a random number, and player two could be some attacker. So, this is, so, so the question, we really want to know that we're secure against non-deterministic attacks, so to speak. A, so player one wins if he guesses right, i.e. or she guesses right, uh, if b1 equals b2, you could also think of a little, so you could write this player one does something, and player two does something in a little program, right? There's player one making his or her probabilistic choice, there's player two making their probabil a 
okay, non-deterministic choice. Okay. So how how are, how are we how are we to balance these things? Okay. So one there's two obvious possibilities to think of. One's a set of distributions and outcomes, and one's a distribution and set of outcomes. Okay. Depending which kind of non-determinism we happen to resolve first. So suppose we choose player two first. Okay, so player two makes a choice. <coughs> a, I think player two is the one on top, if I remember correctly. So here player two chooses. But this is meant. These little balls are, st are meant to be states with two two variables in the top, both Boolean. So the top can be black and white, and so can the bottom. <coughs> so there, player two. <coughs> chooses white, and here player 2 chooses 1, and then randomly player 1 will choose white or black and white or black, okay. So a probability a half player 1 wins, <coughs> okay, probability a half player 2 wins also for that matter. On the other hand, this way, player 1 makes his choice, and then player 2 can either agree or disagree, so there's nothing to say <coughs> probabilistically here. So, we, so it's, we're pretty sure don't want to go down that route really like to go down this route. But the question is, how do we go down this route? Well, maybe we do it, as it were, just with this program. So the semantics of this program should really come out like this, okay? But it doesn't. And that, that's, that, that's the real puzzle. So, God, I rehearsed what I was about to say next, I'll probably get it wrong. <laughs> A, well, I, I, what you t I would like to point you to this particular distribution. The trouble is there's four possibilities. When you, this is, you can think of this as kind of an operational semantics, but you have to bring together the choices against the distributions. A, so this, basically, the, player one probabilistically can do a half or a half. Player two can non-deterministically do one or the other. So one combination here is player one chooses probability half white, black, and player two just happens to choose black or white. So one of the possibilities is actually that player one loses with probability one. Okay, so the, the, this is an example of something that was not in that set of distributions. Well, why is it there? I mean, I've did, drawn a picture here of how the semantics might work. Does the semantics really work like that? Well, sadly, it does. I mean, it depends on you semantics. So I'd like to look at things algebraically a little, a little bit. Well, what would be the laws? Combining non-determinism and probability. I mean, this is a theme that many people have looked at. So you're going to have some. You're going to have a choice operation, a that, a, a probabilistic operator that. Each of them separately will have the usual laws, like union will be commutative and absorptive, and there's a bunch of laws for plus. So here I'm only focusing on the laws of their interaction. And you see, you want some laws. See, we were talking before about resolving which one we resolve first. Okay. So suppose we decide to resolve a what's this, resolve, resolve a probability first. Okay. But as a matter of fact, we've resolved non-determinism first. Okay, then we might like this law. Well, I've got this the right way around. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes. Yes, that's right, that's right. One, okay. So this would be a natural law that turns one kind of result, resolution into another. It's an absolutely horrible law a, in the following strict sense that you can prove by equational logic that all, all, all quantitative information gets lost. <coughs> that choosing between x and y probability p is the same as choosing between x and y probability q for any p and q. Okay, this is getting pretty bad. A, and the free algebra we set is like this, this, this kind of thing. It's just sets of sets of some kind. Actually, I didn't completely check it out, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. But I know that I know that this part's the case. Okay, so that's bad. So how about the other way around? Which is anyway what we wanted, right? We wanted to get a non-determinism coming in first. So suppose we start off with probability first and then non-determinism. It's natural to distribute that over that. And then the free algebra is beautiful. Over a set, it's just a non-empty convex sets of distributions over X. So I was very happy when, when things like that began to appear. And I already knew this kind of security problem in a different context from uh, John Mitchell's work. I thought, great, we're going to... And he had terrible troubles with exactly this thing. He was trying to... He said, okay, we'll model non-determinism as a probabilistic choice. But then all the laws of non-determinism sort of disappeared. I thought, well, great, we're going to be able to do this stuff for John. But sadly, if you happen to use this as your semantics for that program, you do get all the four things. 
and that's the puzzle. Uh, I basically present it to you. I mean, this is, so the rest of the talk is an example of an attempt at that puzzle, combined with the difficulties, well, the gradual features of um, of, uh, of, of random random variables. Okay, so the so the rest of the talk is about the paper. Which the, oh, we got actually this. Oh, we got four. How about um, let's say fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Okay. <laughs> Fifteen minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Not fifteen. Yeah, yeah. English pronunciation. So anyway, so define. So what, what the idea is, we define high level and low level languages. The high level has abstract locations. The low level has the physical memory. We're going to compile one into the other, and and the locations themselves. So it's a high level and low level language. But sadly, there's also a high level and low level of locations, or high level. Are the important ones, they're the private ones that we don't want to let anyone know the values of, and the low level ones are the public ones that we can let anyone know. <coughs> yes, that's right, the diagrams are consistent with that. Okay, Hi. what are attackers? This is following some ideas of a, from the spy car list of Martin and Andy. It's we view attackers as contexts that can do anything at all with the programs except they can't have access to the private variables. So the, so the public context, okay, and then following the spike alpha tradition, you're interested in equivalency, security equivalency. So two co commands, because we we'll only get as far as first order here, a, two commands are equivalent if they are, give the, are the same in all public contexts. Actually, I use a, a less than or equal to example, and we're doing kind of partial correctness, so it's kind of four star. That's just technicalities. And then, and we want to. What we want to show is that if we've got two commands, high-level ones, and they're once refines the other, or or have them equal, and this refinement reflects only public variable visibility. Mm -hmm. You're only interested in the, the only observations you can make are on public variables. That's what that low L part means. That low is public. So it's a, so it's a, specifically that kind of operation uh, observation. If anyway, if they're equivalent or less than each other for all high-level public contexts, that's going to be the same as their compilation. In, in their compilation, they can do arithmetic and pointers and things. A, they're going to be the same for all low-level low public contexts there. The low-level public contexts have much more capacity than these high-level ones, because they can do arbitrary arithmetic and addresses. Okay. So, that's, so the plan is to show these two things the same, and the method is to show that's the same as some logical relations characterization or, or what's it called, your simulation thing. And that's the same as some other one and then relate these two. Okay. So in some sense there's little to say more. The rest of the talk is just, no, no, actually there's some important points I want to get back to. But the rest of the talk is largely carrying out that program. So here, here's the language, here's non-determinism. <coughs> and the many locations, as I said, are divided into private, high or, and public, low. A store is a function of locations to values like always. And the natural Semantics for this is just the horse semantics, natural horse semantics that map stores into a subsets of stores, lower, lower subsets of stores. A, okay. So what's the refinement level? Refinement relation. So, 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 so there's a set, okay. And the top part is the what? Let's see. The, the top part, I've forgotten already, that's bad. Top parts are either high or low, let's see. Yeah, the, the, the top part's high, right, as it ought to be. Okay, so the top part's the private variables, the bottom part's the low, the low part. So here we normally, no, non deterministically choose between these two, and then we compare that to non deterministically choosing between these three. And that is less than that, because you see here, the we don't really care, we only care, that, that, see, this is in there, from a whole point of view. I mean, I know they're different there, but they're only different at the high part, which you can't actually observe. So as long as they're the same at the low part, you're okay. And similarly here, we're okay up to there. Okay. So that's just said formally here, that x is less than y. For every store s, you take the low part, the part, part you can't see in x, that's also, that's the low part of some, possibly some other store in, in that's actually not said correctly. It should be for all S in stores, there's an S prime and Y such that sort of three lines. But anyway, that's what it was meant. And then for any commands, C's refine C prime if 
Uh, when you start off at S, what you get is low, is, is, is below, you know, is what finds it in that sense. So, that, so that's the natural thing. Uh, how about simulation? Well, as I said, you want to find simulation relation on commands, which makes this theorem true. <coughs> and it would be fairly straightforward if we were only deterministic. Uh, so this is the kind of thing you'd want. You, you'd want to, you, you just want to have some relation between the private... You, you know what the relation has to be at the public things, it has to be quality. On the private, we don't know what it is, so it's just some relation. So, maybe, so, so the idea is we've got some relation on the top half, you see that, so maybe blue is related to red. And we put that relation together to get a relation on the whole state, that's just the relation on the public part of the state. And so these two things are related because the bottom parts are the same, the top parts are related that way. Okay. And then the program should take them into these two guys, and they're related because their bottom parts are the same, as a matter of fact, the yellow and the green are related. So, so that'd be jolly good. But, but we're actually non-deterministic, so it gets a bit more complicated. So now, instead of having a relation between pairs <coughs> of private states, <coughs> non-deterministic could be various possibilities. So you have a relation between sets of private states. Okay? So there's the relation there, two sets of private states. And that gives a relation between two sets of whole states. That gives the commands produce this bunch of stuff. And you sort them out according to what the public part is. So if you, if you look at the white parts here, you get these two things should be in the red relation on the private states. And here they are, again, the same public parts. The, the green and the, the, the yellow and green should be in the relation. Okay, so that's the idea. So, so just making it a little bit more formal. You begin with, a, I'm not going to speak about how things at the bottom get handled. Uh, you speak with, you start with a relation on private stores, and it can't be any relation. You want to be up or closed mm -hmm. on the right, reflecting the whole thing that's going on. <coughs> some conditions, okay, but I'm not going to go into these conditions. <coughs> you construct this R plus, so this is the R, then that's the R plus on stores, and then you define refinement as just preserving the R plus relation. And then the theorem, which isn't such an easy theorem, is the one I said earlier. So, so now, now let's go on to the uh, low-level situation. So it's straightforward, but there's a bunch of things one has to keep in one's mind. So first of all, we have a bunch of, of memory addresses, like I said. We can number them from 1 to R. And the memory is just a, a, a map from the set. It's a partial mapping from the set of addresses to values. It's partial because some memory addresses may not have been allocated yet. You're going to somehow remember that or to note it somehow. A, if, if I've got a layout on the other hand, it's an injective mapping from locations to the addresses. That's telling you where you're putting all the locations which are in your abstract notion of store. Now, this is just doing the kind of thing that Steve was talking about yesterday, but now we, we need to do it to get some improvements. <coughs> anyway, so given a store and a layout, we can get a memory. I've already said this really. So, so given this store, it's going to lay out location one, it's going to go on word seven, and maybe location three is going to go on word 14 and so forth. So you, you'll get this memory there. Okay. Good. So we, fi we fix a public layout because that's <coughs> meant to be completely visible. We're not going to worry about that. A, but what do we do with private layout? We're going to randomize it. So we take a distribution, fixed distribution, which I'm not going to tell you what it is. I mean, you choose it, but that doesn't matter too much. A, well, no, maybe I should see something more helpful. I'll, I'll wait to see that. We, we, we use a distribution to, for the layouts. And then one important thing a, is this, punk, this number delta. So we take any, for a, any bit of the store that can be used for a private <coughs> location. And the question is, for a random a, layout, what's the chance of that? Being used for a layout. So this is this is. So this gives you a, a, a bound on the attacker's probability of success. You know, next probability of success has to be less than this probability. A great, sorry. Yes, that's right. I, I hope I've got the right bearing. Anyway, in the, in the case when d is uniform, this is just one minus number of private locations minus divided by the number of addresses available for private locations. So hopefully there's a small, this is a small number, this is a huge number. So basically with, with, with a probability one, the attacker will fail. Uh, and, and, this, and one can arrange such things to be the case. A D, uniformity is a natural thing in some sense, but if you're thinking about a line, a laying out arrays, 
then what, and you're going to lay them out contiguously, once you've randomly chosen where to lay out the first element of the array, that will determine the other ones, but then the distribution isn't always going to be uniform. But any, anyway, whatever it is, we're going to get this number of delta that's going to appear in the theorems. And, and this is just say, saying again the, the, how the scheme of randomization works. So th this is the low-level language. In, yeah, I think I know what I want to do. In, so what I want to point out about that, the critical things are that previously this was of type log. This was a location constant. Now it's of type nat, natural number. A, now we can look up any natural number, which may or may not be laid out, and we can assign to any natural number. So, let's see. So, the, so, the, so the, this is the next thing, the next interesting bit, I guess. The question is, what's the semantics of this language going to be? And it turns out it can't be any of a number of things. Okay. So suppose we take, I mean, you wouldn't expect it to be this anyway. You give the memory in a layout, maybe, and you can get, you can give it a set of memories that you get as a result. But that's not good for semantics because if you take this, this is our bad example. This is an example in which, this is an example, there's four uh, memory cells and the opponent just non-deterministically tries to guess all of them. Okay, nothing stopping the opponent writing this. Uh, so no matter what the initial layout is, uh, there's going to be four results. And one of them the opponent gets lucky and the other three doesn't get lucky. But since it's a set, you, you don't see this quantitative information, it just all vanishes. So for every layout, you just could be lucky or unlucky, so that, this is no good. Okay. Uh, so we need to resolve probabilities after non-determinism, which is what we thought, but we can't use just distributions because our events aren't independent. So there's an, a little example. Suppose there's just one location and two non-public addresses. Okay. Then that location is either going to be laid out at one or two, so if I test at one and I test at two, I should always have an error. But if, uh, if we're just here, as if we randomly choose a layout, and here randomly choose some other layout independently, then both of them could succeed. So there'll be some probability of success, so that's, that's pretty bad. Uh, so you can't do that. So the solution idea is to replace distributions by random variables, <coughs> and with layouts of the sample space, and, and using, you'd like to use this. This, this is naturally to use. But that doesn't work either. <laughs> and it's essentially because of the problem that I said before. If you, if you think about how to compose these things, it's like H of probability of H of probabilities. You're going to have to do some kind of distribution of one or the other. That takes us right back to the problem we had in the first place, and, and it doesn't bloody work. So, so Jeremy's ingenious idea, which horrified me until I got used to it when it seemed natural. <laughs> Was to replace was, it, was just to use for composition the Claisley structure in H, and to go from layouts to memories to layouts to memories. So we're always working with these functions. Well, we've got four minutes now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Three. <laughs> okay. So I'll just say how this example would work, and I'll, I'll jump over a lot. So, so, so suppose we start off a with this thing. So this is this is this is this is, this is the function from layout from layouts to memories given by starting off with a, our unique private location holding blue. There's four possibilities. And after each of them, you'll get various possibilities. But, but these possibilities tell you what you get for each layout. Then we can, we've got the distribution of the layouts. So we can see in each of these cases, with high probability it fails. So, so that's the essential thing. Okay. So I'm probably going to skip over technicalities now. So this is the... <laughs> glad to hear it. What? Glad to hear it. <laughs> I'm glad to see it. <laughs> well, they're interesting technicalities. Anyway, <laughs> this, this, is, this is Chai. That, that's a, a good friend after a while. That just is what one uses for recording errors. So, for example, this is how an assignment, you know, you can do any assignment unless you're out of, but you're not in the layout, so that it gets an error. Uh, no, no, you're not assigned, that's right. You're not layout. Uh, then this illustrates how weird it all is. You, you, <laughs> you, you've given a function, this command, it's, a, it's an, a conditional, this conditional a, will give various possible such functions and layouts. The only parts of these functions are relevant because this part, you can remove these red parts because they only occur 
in the case when w is false, so this part's relevant. So what you have to do is you have to make a function by taking some of this function and one, take one of these functions and take the non-red part of it, take one of this function and take the non-red part of it and combine them. It's really, really weird. Anyhow, that's what happens. And then I think I won't go through, this is the technicalities, but one's just going through a, a nastier version of what one was doing before and surviving with the probabilities to make things work. And, and that all works. Uh, and it's more complicated. But I wanted to say one last thing. The question is, what the heck's going on? And, and I don't know. But one observation is that you can relativize this semantics. So rather than over a set of layers, for any subset of layers, you can get such a semantics. And then that becomes natural in the pre sheaf of, su of the su subsets of layers. So we have, actually, it's a pre sheaf here. So that might be relevant. On the other hand, we've got exactly the same problem whether it's random variables or not, so it might be irrelevant. And I haven't had any time to go into it. If you think going to operational semantics helps, it doesn't. The same problems are there, they just come up in different forms. So I'm really puzzled, so I hope, I hope you've got some, I hope, I hope I've got some of this puzzlement over why, why one is puzzled. Okay, thanks. concerned about this low level issues, then it's not just the data that has the layout in memory, but also the code. Yeah, sure. So... Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a million things. This is just the simplest model to get okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so what, what if you were to do your combination of notitons and probabilities as a map of decision process with partial observability, right? It would help, it would give you the probability of happening in both the situations. Where, where the, uh, the situations being uh, who chooses first, player one or player two? If you say so, I'm very interested. I'll have to talk to you. Yeah, but, but I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong on, on that. That I so so this would be an uh, operational approach on, on this. Operate. What? I kind of don't believe you, but I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know enough to, to see what, what why I would, yeah why I would. I'd yeah, like yeah, to no, talk no, to you. No, 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 we have to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually, um, <clears throat> these random variables, one thinks of them as the probabilistic analog of predicates. And so I was expecting to see some kind of backward semantics. So there's, in fact, a duality between semantics in terms of distributions transforming forwards and random variables, expectation values of random variables transforming backwards. Well, it would be, that's a, I didn't think about reality at all in this context. That's an interesting thing about it. I'd be surprised if reality has got you to some magic place. But maybe, maybe the reality says we're the same on both sides. But right, but I, I understand this in a purely probabilistic world. What? I understand this in a purely probabilistic uh, yeah. world. Not a determinism, I'm not sure. No one has all these things hiding in the corner there. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, I right. What? <laughs> 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 okay, that's, that's that goes again.